was in elementary school, I was taken to go see a rock show. I didn't want to see a show that night. I wanted to stay home and play. However, when I got to the show and watched the story unfold before me on the stage, I was hooked. I had already become a theater kid, enjoying summer's acting and summer camp shows. Seeing how this rock music, which I had previously dismissed as grown-up music I couldn't understand, told a flashy story with actors coming on stage interspersed with songs, seemed to me the pinnacle of culture. The show I saw was, of course, the 90s touring version of The Who's Quadrophenia. <laughs> From that day on, I became a disciple of the Who, learning intricately the details of the band. Daltrey, Townsend, Entwistle, Moon became daily topics in my house. As I became a teenager, I even tried my best to buy polo shirts and dress with the mod aesthetic associated with Quadrophenia. I looked up to the main character of that album, Jimmy, and saw myself as the same kind of helpless dancer, the same kind of romantic. But Jimmy ends up all alone on a rock in the middle of the sea. And in the film version, he throws a scooter off the edge of a cliff, and it is only speculated that the very first image of the film shows him walking away. Is it me? With that said, I've recently rewatched Quadrophenia on a clear and crisp transfer. Who doesn't love the Criterion Collection? When I first bought the film and watched it for the very first time, it was never so clear as this. Actually, a DVD existed, but that was not available immediately. As a creature of habit and instant gratification, I bought the VHS version during the rise of the DVD regime. For those who may never have seen the film or listened to the album, the basic story is this. Jimmy is a mod who is struggling with four different aspects of his personality. In the language of the time, Pete Townsend calls him more than schizophrenic, thinking that it's a clever joke to change the first part of the word to quad. He later called this a naive misunderstanding of schizophrenia. The album came out 50 years ago, so we can expect some wonkiness in the terminology. We'll still listen to Lola, for example, even though the Raincoats version is much better. <laughs> The song itself is pretty accepting, even if some of the lyrics are definitely of their time. Quadrophenia is of a time and about a different time. Jimmy is searching for a place to belong, and he thinks that his subculture, the mods, define him exactly. But Jimmy can't fit in because of his emotion. He can't fit in because he's torn apart both by wanting to belong and wanting to be different. He sees the previous generation, that of his parents, as having been war heroes, but no longer willing to stand up for what they believe in no longer willing to stand up for a better world. He tries on different characters in his search. He idolizes the Who, but finds out that they are just normal people who play music with their own deep contradiction. Jimmy is so torn up about the world that when he finds out a former lover is going with his friend, he takes a bunch of pills and books a train ticket to Brighton. He takes a bunch more pills on the train. <laughs> Experiences disappointment after disappointment. He finds out that Amadi thought was cool and above it all was just a working person like himself. Everything seems pointless, so he gets drunk, takes a boat out to a rock in the ocean, and then just sits there thinking. What happens after that is left as the rain pours down is unresolved. The movie is a little different, but not so much as to be unrecognizable from its source material. This isn't the difference between Tommy and the Tommy movie, which begins with the wrong person in the film being killed. <laughs> The 
Premium film, however, introduces Jimmy Cooper, played by Phil Daniels, who is living in London. <laughs> We learn that he has a mailroom job that he does not enjoy. When not working, Jimmy spends his time participating in the mod subculture, listening to bands like The Who and The Small Faces. The mod subculture emerged in post-war Britain, partly as a reaction to the conservatism of the time. It focused on well-tailored suits, riding scooters, and listening to jazz, music, and rock and roll bands like The Who. The plot really kicks off when Jimmy encounters Steph, played by Leslie Ash, and it is clear that he is attracted to her. He follows her to a party, though she is escorted there by another mod. When she leaves, Jimmy can't find her, and he is so high on his pedigree that he cannot even figure out how to drive his scooter properly to leave the party. In one telling moment at the party, Jimmy makes out with Monkey, played by Toyo Wilcox, but immediately stops and throws her off of him when he sees just a glimpse of Steph. You forgot I worked in a chemist. <laughs> He doesn't like that she is slow dancing with someone who isn't him, so he throws on the Who's My Generation. <laughs> he meets up with an old friend who is a rocker, a member of a rival gang. That friend, Kev, says he doesn't care about the differences between this group and that group, but Jimmy does. I don't give a monkey's assholes about mods and rockers. And then they've all the same, aren't we? Kev, that's it. Well, I don't want to be the same as everybody else. That's why I'm a mod, see? This leads to trouble when after a mod is hurt by the rockers, the mod gang chases down and beats up Kev. When Jimmy realizes, he flees the scene. He doesn't do anything to stop the problem, to explain, or to help his former mod friend. The mods head to Brighton for a weekend of dancing and clashes with the rockers. He connects with Steph, but when she says she wants to dance next to the Ace Face, who is played by Sting, he instead dances from the rafters and crowd dies. He's thrown out and sleeps all night on the beach. The next morning, the mods pile onto the streets of Brighton, where they spot several rockers that beat up one of their group. This leads to a violent clash on the streets, during which Jimmy and Steph have a romantic liaison. <laughs> Jimmy is caught up in a sweep after the riot and shares a van with the ace face. However, when he gets back home, he is thrown out, he quits his job, and he keeps thinking everything's going backwards since Brighton. He finds that Steph has moved on to his friend, Dave. He tries to fight him. Having quit his job, he takes the train back to Brighton, where he sees the ace face's scooter. At first, he is happy to see this idol, but that turns to anger when he sees that the ace face is working as a bellboy. Boy! Boy! Jimmy drives the scooter off the cliff, probably not going with it, though that point is debatable. In both album and film versions, the story isn't fully resolved. Basically, the story uses the same narrative trick that Darren Aronofsky's The Wrestler pulled. You are required to fill in the gap. I want to talk specifically about this movie because while watching it this time, now safely distanced by my 20s from my teenage years, I see the story differently. As a teenager, I thought, yes, Jimmy is that romantic hero sacrificing everything for his principles. He is coming of age. But now I see that he has accomplished nothing, only replicated the system in which he lived. Jimmy Cooper is a participant in a consumer capitalism as much as he might claim to reject it. I want to look specifically at the three romantic relationships Jimmy engages in. His objectification of Monkey, his fetishization of Steph, and his codependency with the mod lifestyle. The latter, of course, in forms of former two romances, but it is that capitalist rejection that leads to most of Jimmy's problems. Let's consider the scenes where Monkey interacts with Jimmy. She is excited to see him, happy to be part of the gang. She throws herself into making out with him. You forgot I worked in a chemist. However, when he throws her off him to chase after Steph, he shows her that he does not value her as a person. She is an object only useful until he gets the newer, better, supposedly more attractive model. She shakes it off and joins him with the party, but you can still tell that she is hurt by the fact that Jimmy doesn't see her as anything other than an object. Later on, when Jimmy and his friends have raided a chemist for pills, she says that she could have told them exactly where to go. They haven't even thought of asking her to help them. Even if they are engaged in a burglary, she doesn't seem to even register as anything to them. At best, she's just one of the gang. Jimmy seems to treat most of his friends this way. He tries to get a pill connection from one friend, despite that friend saying no. He only values 30 for his connection to drugs. I want about a dozen. Fuck off, Jim. 
Well, all right, all right. 20, but how much? Well, they're pretty scarce right now, you know? I mean, I had to go over the water to get these. Oh, yeah, you got on a banana boat back to Jamaica, did you? No, Brixton. And as you know, Jim, it costs money to get down there. And, of course, he does not see Steph as her own person. He sees her as belonging to him, as a fantasy object. He sexualizes and lusts after her, but seems to behave badly specifically because of his interest in her. Where'd the bird go? For example, in the scene where Jimmy throws Monkey off of him, he does so because he sees Steph. Seeing her with another man instead of him angers him. Unable to express himself because he is supposed to be part of the gang, he disrupts the party. He would rather disrupt the party as it is multiple times than try to communicate his feelings to Steph directly. This happens again in Brighton at the dance club when Steph wants to go dance with him, but wants to dance specifically near the A's face. Instead of asking her why, or explaining that he's feeling jealousy and unpacking his emotions, there's no way to know how Steph would respond as he doesn't really ask her anything, only tries to put the moves on her, he gets up and calls attention to himself. It's all about him the entire time. Steph and Jimmy have their liaison, the focus is on pleasing him much more than pleasing her. And when he returns from being in court with the ace face to find Steph and Dave are in a relationship now, his reaction is to attack his friend. Once again, Monkey tries to stop it, tries to intervene on Jimmy's behalf, but he rejects her for being part of the gang. Alex from A Clockwork Orange has more emotional intelligence, and he definitely hurt people. <laughs> Jimmy's actions suggest he does not see Steph as having intelligence of her own. Of course, he couldn't really talk to her, not like a real person. Hence his stalking of her when she has nothing to say to him. That rejection doesn't go well at all because Jimmy doesn't get what he wants. So just leave me alone, Jimmy. Just leave me alone, all right? Steph, please. Steph, please. Oh, fuck off! The movie illustrates this well. Directly after he is rejected by Steph, his GS scooter is smashed up. His emotional breakdown over the bike is violent in the same way his breakdown over losing Steph is violent. I say losing Steph, but that's in line with Jimmy's thinking. Steph wasn't his to begin with, and Jimmy clearly couldn't see her as her own person. So he runs away back to where it all made sense. He revisits the site of their liaison, deciding to get over it. Fuck it. He's actually starting to rally when he catches sight of the ace face, and that sets off his anger and disappointment yet again. Jimmy's treatment of Monkey and Steph is a direct reflection of the values embedded within the mod lifestyle. The subculture, which emphasized material possessions and appearances, leads Jimmy to view people as commodities to be used and discarded, much like his scooter or his clothes. His relationships with Monkey and Steph reveal the underlying codependency between Jimmy's romantic pursuit and the consumerist nature of the mod culture. So what causes all of this? Well, the culture that Jimmy lives in. And it's a culture that has specific contradiction at the center. The culture is seen as a rejection of the mainstream, is seen as a new way of finding a place to belong. The mods are their own world of sex, of drugs, and of rock and roll. Just like the rockers, but don't tell them that. It's the classic teenage story. It's Rebel Without a Cause. You're tearing me apart! What? If mainstream culture is the parents' world of getting a job, settling down, and so on, that's not what Jimmy wants. That's not what the mods want. They want to stand out. They want to be larger than life. They want their lives to matter. So they group up together. They gang together. Jimmy explains it. I don't want to be the same as everybody else. That's why I'm a mod, see? But mods like the army or like rockers or like everyone have a specific dress code. Wear this suit, do these drugs, listen to this music, don't listen to that music. Of course, the music they listen to must be purchased at stores as do the clothes, as do the bikes. In fact, the endless attaching of mirror after mirror to a scooter shows the amount of money that a mod makes. It shows commodity fetishism for the object. Jimmy treats the scooter, the suit, the music the same way he treats the women. They are to be used as commodities in his possession. The same thing is true of how he treats his friend. For instance, Jimmy turns to his friend Ferdy solely for his access to drugs and disregards any other aspect of their friendship. This disregard for the well-being and emotions of his friend extends to his actions during the chemist raid. Monkey, who could have provided valuable information to help them, is entirely overlooked by Jimmy and the gang. These examples illustrate how Jimmy's relationships are primarily driven by his pursuit of commodities 
and how he uses his friends for his own gain. The rebellion that the mods embody ends up being no rebellion at all. The very focus of the entire subculture is based on money. Having the best clothes, the best food, and the best girl, all of these are attempts not to build a culture different from the mainstream, but to mimic the mainstream. Consider the ace face in court. To pay a fine of 75 pounds. I'll pay now if you don't mind. <laughs> He is seen as cool, both by mods and rockers, because his monetary value appears to be better than theirs. He even gets to stand apart from everyone else, because money makes him special. The mod subculture, despite presenting itself as a rebellion against mainstream values, ultimately reinforces the same consumer-driven mentality it claims to reject. This is evident in the way the mods display their wealth through their clothes, through their scooters, and through other material possessions. The ace face, who is admired for his financial status, exemplifies how the mod culture commodifies this rebellion. Similarly, Jimmy's job in marketing serves as a reminder that even he, as supposed rebel, is participating in the very system he claims to oppose. Through its portrayal of Jimmy's relationships and actions, the film demonstrates the inescapable nature of consumer capitalism and its impact on personal identity, highlighting the need for a more profound understanding of our own participation in this system. So the whole thing comes down to a contradiction, the same kind of contradiction I spoke about in my review of the Punk Rock Museum. Rebellion is always for sale and is easily sold to you. I bought into it. Why, back in 2004, I was searching into the Green Day album American Idiot. That's another rock opera about another teenager who cannot find a way to fit in, who ends up being part of the very society they once raged against. What I once saw as the rebellion, I now see as buying into the system. After all, someone had to spend the money to market the Who to me, to market Green Day to me, even to market Anti-Flag to me. Well, not that last one. I was just sitting on a lawn when a friend came up and plastered headphones on my head when I heard, You gotta die, gotta die, gotta die for your government! Die for your country, that shit! That kicked off any of my interest in punk. Jimmy's caught up in the marketing. Literally, as I have previously mentioned, his job in the movie is at a marketing firm. Sure, he steals advertising sketches, but where does he go after he rejects outward society and the movement that he had stapled his identity to. The movie suggests he walks away, but the album ends with Love Rain Over Me and no clear indication of where he can go from being stuck on a rock in the rain. The unresolved nature of both the album and the film's narrative invites the audience to ponder the consequences of Jimmy's choices and consider the difficulty of finding a genuine escape from the trappings of consumer capitalism. We are stuck right now like Jimmy. We have a culture that prizes people as objects, that still thinks in terms of money, that continues to sell Rebellion for $25 a band shirt at Hot Topic. This movie, like Rebel Without a Cause, or even That'll Be the Day, shows the problems of young people as they try to fit into society. The same way that American Idiot did. There will be countless other pieces of media showing emotionally torn up teenagers rebelling and then reincorporating back into society. I haven't even mentioned SLC Punk. This contradiction will continue. So how can we try to solve these problems and become better? There's a reason the movie and album knew that up to us. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something and that I presented something of a coherent argument. I really love Quadrophenia and The Who precisely because when you go back to the music at different stages of your life, it means different things. Of course, all music is that way because you never really hear the songs the same way. It's always informed by what's going on inside and outside. But that is a topic perhaps for another video. Generic appeal to like and subscribe right here, right now.